once I put it out there that I was going to do this thing, it was like, okay, well now, now I have to do it because I made it, you know, I put it out there and made it real. So it kind of held me accountable. Hello and welcome to another episode of Cut to Reveal, where we talk about the editing art form and all the hurdles of that art form, career path, of that career path. On today's episode, we're talking with Anthony Moreshi, who is a New England-based Emmy Award-winning uh, filmmaker and editor. Uh, he put out his own docu-series called Don't Stand in Line, which he filmed and edited all of himself. So he comes from a very DIY or do-it-yourself uh, background. Uh, grew up in the punk and hardcore scene and BMX and skateboarding and whatever, and that's really like transferred to his skills as an editor and the way he thinks about um, his projects and whatever. And we had a very interesting conversation with him. Yeah, we talked about film distribution because, you know, mm -hmm. he distributed uh, Don't Stand In Line himself. Uh, mm -hmm. And he also, you know, had used like the uh, traditional distributing system as well in the past. So we talked yeah. about like advantages, disadvantages, uh, you know, bad stories, good stories about <laughs> that stuff. Like, uh, yeah, it, it was very interesting to hear, especially, you know, for, for, for me, because like, uh, my go-to point is where, where I create and I have like control over my mm -hmm. own content. Right. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons I do YouTube. Right. So, um, so, so it was super interesting for me to hear his, you know, uh, advantages and uh, struggles with distribution and yeah, uh, running his own uh, series, yeah. creating his own series, which is which is pretty cool. I only watched the first episode. I know you watched all of it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting, definitely, uh, especially if you are in that like in that niche. It's a series about people who basically kind of go their own way, more along that DIY ethos. Um, so yeah, he offered a lot of great insight into into that and to into as Peter said, the um, distribution thing. So with that, let's roll the tape. So I got started editing basically through BMX and skateboarding, just from watching skate videos and BMX videos and wanting to sort of document what me and my friends were doing. Um, at the time, that was like the late 80s, early 90s. Video cameras were super expensive. Every once in a while, my dad would rent a video camera because he worked at Polaroid, so they didn't make video cameras, but he was kind of interested in all that stuff. So he would rent one and it was like this old, it was like a camera and it had this big giant, like, um, I guess it was the, where you put the tape, the machine oh, would yeah, go yeah. around your waist <laughs> and like, yeah. it didn't, you have to plug it into the wall. So he was <laughs> renting those like when I was like in fifth grade. And then by the time I was in high school, they, they advanced quite a bit. So you could, you know, put a battery in it and carry it around. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. And um, so like for my birthday one weekend, he, he rented a camera and it, I went out and I take it out with my friends skating and stuff. And um, little did I know that they had actually bought it for me. So that was my birthday present. It was like the cool, it was really the best present ever. I think yeah. they realized that this was like the only thing that I was actually truly interested in that might lead to some kind of career so that was huge other people have told the story many times but i figured out how to connect that to a vcr mm -hmm. and kind of like do rough edits back and forth and that's what i was really interested in i found mm -hmm. like being able to take that footage and restructure it in a way um that was different than the way you shot it mm -hmm. like i i don't know i thought that was really cool i figured out how to lay music down on it um which by the time you got to a finished edit it was like fourth generation of VHS yeah. quality, yeah. but it was fun. I think I think I even got, the, I had this little box I got from Radio Shack that you could put in between the VCR, like the two VCRs and you could do like rough, like you could do like wipes and fades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like it had like, do, like star wipes and all those kind of things. Um, but luckily even then I realized I didn't really want to do the star wipes. I was mostly <laughs> using the dissolve and the, and maybe like a, like a like a like a, some sort of basic wipe you know after that i guess i i'm trying to think like i went to college they didn't have much i went to northeastern they didn't really have much in terms of like editing programs i think there mm -hmm. was at that point avid was fairly new they had an avid and then they had this thing called media 100 mm -hmm. 
like real early nonlinear editing systems. And there was two in the, on the whole campus. I got on them maybe once. They were always broken and being repaired. Mm -hmm. And then I, a couple years later, I ended up leaving school early and I got a job working for a place doing basically installing media 100 systems. I was doing temp work and every day all I would do would sit online and look for any job that had anything to do with video production. And I must have applied to a thousand places. Mm -hmm. And um, this one, I don't know, they gave me a shot. I kind of did the whole just fake it till you make it thing where like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I've made it yet, but um, <laughs> you know, I just totally faked it. They're like, oh, you know how to do this? Yeah, I know everything when it comes to Macs. I know how to... <laughs> PCs inside it out. I never even used a real PC, I don't think. But I remember I I bought one of the first Macs that had Firewire on it. I think I still have it behind me somewhere. I basically got a credit card. I bought the it was the blue and white Mac G3 mm -hmm. and a Sony camera that had Firewire. And then I I started teaching myself like a real real old version of Premiere. Mm -hmm. And I did, this was actually before I went in to interview for the job. So by the time I went in, I had like a little bit enough that I could kind of pretend I knew my way around things. And the guy that was training me, I think kind of caught on, but it was pretty cool about it. And he's like, as long as you figure it out. And he gave me a shot and like, he was really good about teaching me stuff. So I learned, that's, oh, that's what, cool. how I, I kind of learned. Ended up moving out to California. So, oh, here's the other, here's a, a big thing. At the time, DVD authoring was brand new. I had learned that working at that company. And when I left that company and moved out to California and I was driving around Costa Mesa, just happened to see on the side of the building, the big 411 video magazine logo. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but 90s, early 2000s in the skateboarding industry, that was the thing as far as skate videos go, you know, mm -hmm. talking about pre-internet and all that, like they were huge. And it was like my dream to work there. So I went in with a resume. I was like, I know how to do DVD authoring and all this stuff. And um, I had been working on a, a BMX video and I gave him a copy of that. And uh, they ended up calling me and hiring me. That's, That's how awesome. I got like my professional break in actually making the content. Honestly, I think they hired me because I knew how to fix the Media 100 systems. And yeah. <laughs> they wanted someone who worked there because at the time they were so flaky. Yeah. And I don't, did, did you guys work on those systems at all? No, like I, ever, I never, like, I worked on what was called division, which became like edit and then kind of just became obsolete. But yeah, it was around the same time as all that stuff. I mean, though. there was a lot to know to configure. They were definitely yeah. not plug and play. Um, yeah. And if something went wrong, like trying to figure it out, like troubleshooting it was, was crazy. The hard drives, the SCSI drives, which were like, oh. mm -hmm. they used to call it SCSI voodoo. And it was... It really was like you could restart the system 20 times, try all these different things. And on your 21st try, it might work for even if you didn't change anything, it might just decide to work and then be fine for six months. Yeah. But, uh, and look and at that. All, you know, so uh, we, we just <laughs> yeah. complain on, on Premiere all, all the time, right? Oh. <laughs> it's that's, great. That's I mean, well, reality, to be honest, yeah. I had a similar issue with, with my computer earlier today, but to be fair, it's because I'm running a Hackintosh. So yeah, yeah, it's getting Thunderbolt to work correctly on a Hackintosh is kind of like the old days of SCSI. I have a storage unit uh, that, that is supposed to be connected by Thunderbolt as well, but I'm on Windows. So it's kind of tricky to make it work as well, but it works. Yeah, it works cause, now. <laughs> exactly. Because I have to get it working on Windows on the Windows side <laughs> first. Yeah. And then once I get it working on Windows, I have to do this restart and just cross my fingers and hope that it comes up. I don't know. I talked for a long time. I, so basically, that's how I started editing. I, they ha Eventually, I started editing a BMX version of their... They had me doing the DVD authoring for a while. Um, here's something interesting. I'm, I'm sure you guys know Jackass, mm -hmm. obviously. Sure. So before Jackass, they those guys did a video called CKY and CKY2K. Mm -hmm. 4-in-1 yeah. actually distributed that, and I was in charge of... Auth the first vid um, video I actually put on a DVD was CKY2K. Oh, really? So That's amazing. <laughs> I basically... in back in those days, you had to watch it a million times to make sure it encoded properly, so I watched that like... Like, that was my job for a while, basically. <laughs> yeah. Watching skate videos and, and, and people act like jackasses. <laughs> um, Dream job. 
<laughs> so that yeah, that was interesting. And then and then I started. They wanted to do a BMX version of of their of the video magazine they did. So I did that for a couple of years. Ended up moving back to and started working on some documentaries. And now I just do I do some of my own stuff like for documentaries, but as I do some broadcast work and I do some corporate stuff. I have a wedding video company. I like kind of do anything you can think of aside from porn. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, and it's not because I'm above it. Well. I've just never been, <laughs> I've, I've never been offered it. Um, I've done pretty much anything you can think of real estate. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, that was good. I mean, you're kind of, we're kind of all the same, just kind of like getting the jobs that we can. So we can kind of like, we love editing enough that we're like, yeah, I'll edit whatever you give me. Cause I enjoy it and stuff. And then, right. you know, yeah, Obviously although the I, I, actually, want. I I have to admit that I turned out like quite a lot of jobs these these the, 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 for the last during the last three years. I mean, not quite a lot, but you know, I I turned down uh, basically projects that weren't interesting to me. Uh, so you know, I, I I'm on the retainer retainer with my main client, and it gives me kind of yeah. like a luxury luxury to you know to say yeah. no to some things that you know would be additional money, but at the same time. Uh, you know, would take me away from other projects that maybe are not, yeah. you know, uh, profitable that much. But at the same time, you know, they take me to, to to the place where I want to be. So I think it's important to kind of like, you know, balance the, the whole thing as well. I would highly recommend that. That's I've been lucky enough the last four years. My main client has me on retainer as well you know, no offense to them, whatever, but, and I think they know it, it's pretty boring work. Um, Mm -hmm. but it's a good gig because, because I'm on retainer. A lot of times, I mean, you get paid, I don't know about you, but I I usually, I get paid even if I don't do that much work for them. It's, it's kind of a con. And then, you know, one month it'll be slow and the next month I'll be slammed with them, but it does allow me to kind of pick and choose things. And yeah, it took a while to get there. It took a good 15 years to get there, but you know, if, if yeah. you can, I was you can a little bit that, lucky a... to, to, I guess, to, 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 to get to that point a little bit faster. Honestly, I'm like super grateful to, 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 you know, to have that client because like, even though there are, you know, some projects that are a little bit boring as well, uh, some of them are really, really cool actually, but I just feel grateful to have, you know, the luxury to say no to projects that I don't have to take on. When it's all said and done, it's still, you're sitting in front of him computer playing on a computer really you know yeah <laughs> you're getting paid yeah. no matter how boring it is it's like it's still better than 99 percent of the jobs you could be doing i'd like to be a little bit more in the field but maybe that's just me <laughs> <laughs> probably the last i don't know 10 years or so i've been really trying to get shift more towards shooting mm-hmm. and uh-huh. you know i usually edit the stuff i shoot as well so it's not like i haven't been editing but um been trying to do more shooting to it's nice yeah. to get out sometimes and uh-huh. Get uh-huh. Uh-huh. things and honestly i got tired of editing other people's stuff that wasn't that good that's why it's super interesting to me that you started uh you know um uh, your own project because like that that's where kind of i'm like you know moving towards because uh, i actually have this i i, I want like say any details because it's too early to say anything but i have this project i i've read on, on some some like i don't know some blog i think uh, interview with you where you said that you had this project actually five years in your head before you actually acted on it in any way and i have this project in my head as well that's close to five years i think right now in my head i haven't done anything about it but you know speaking about that aspect of me that wants to get more in the field i feel like i should act on it eventually so the question to you i guess for me is like do you feel like you needed those years to grow up to 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 be able to 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 take on that project or do you actually regret not taking it on and acting acting on that idea a little bit earlier I would say a little of both because I mean, I have, I have a list. I have so many projects in my head or or written down on my notes on my phone that I haven't acted on. That was like one thing that I was like, 
what can I do myself that I can control? Because um, I know we, we had talked about, Ricky, when you edited Holding These Moments, or if you guys had mm-hmm. experience editing feature like documentaries, yeah. I did two of those in the past. Mm-hmm. And and I helped shoot them and, and edit those. And I might be drifting from the original question, but this is, to me, this was important for when you're trying to do your own projects. After doing those projects, I learned that I never want to do another documentary without a plan going into mm. it and trying <laughs> yeah. to figure it out all in the edit. I mean, to some extent, yeah, that's okay. always going to happen, but it was so overwhelming and each one took a good three or four years to complete. It was a great learning experience, but I, if you're going to take on a project, whether it's a, a feature or a short, plan it out as much as you can before sh- even shooting. I had a list of projects and I'm looking at them and I'm and they all seem like great ideas, but I wanted to pick the one that I could plan out and sort of outline and stick to the mm-hmm. easiest. So that was the don't stand in line project because the idea was basically if I could go out and hang out with e- these four different people, hang out with each person for a day or two, mm-hmm. ask them all pretty much the same questions and then just, capture what happens in between all that Mm -hmm. that should be pretty easy to put together it was a little harder than i thought but it was still way more structured than anything else i had ever gone out and shot and i think your question was did i regret waiting in in a sense i regret waiting because i could have been probably gotten a lot better i had a lot more of my own projects under my belt obviously you know the more you the more you do the better you get I think it came out a lot better because I did wait and I worked because I I was still out shooting. It was just other things. I mean, I shot, honestly, shooting weddings sounds lame, but you get really good at shooting when you have to Mm. shoot a wedding because you don't get a second shot at it. So you can, and you can play, you can experiment. And a lot of times they want a good product, but they're not dictating how you're going to shoot and what it's all on Mm -hmm. you. It's really that it's, it's like shooting a documentary. Um, So you learn a lot. I shot a bunch of broadcast stuff too, basically lifestyle shows where Mm -hmm. it's kind of low budget, just me and a couple cameras doing everything, sound, audio, lighting, if there was lighting, Um, Mm -hmm. like everything, you know? So between those two types of things, I was, I think I was, I was really ready for it more than I would Mm -hmm. have been if I had tried to do it five years earlier. Yeah, I get it. And I would say, you know, I would, I would say like for me, really the only reason it ever it ever materialized is because one day I just got fed up with, with my, like just looking at this list of things and just feeling like, just feeling lame. Like you're never going to do anything. This Mm -hmm. is it. You know, (laughs) like get up, you call yourself a filmmaker, but you haven't made a film in eight years. You know, you're just doing this tired gun stuff. Like, so like in that moment, I just felt so bad about myself i just immediately said fuck this and i just looked at the people that i had who do i know well enough that'll give me the time of day to like just trust me to do this and i just picked four people and emailed them and and you know it blew me away that they all agreed to do it like right away they got back to me like of course that sounds awesome let's do it which i wasn't expecting really um so once once i put it out there that i was going to do this thing it was like okay well now now i have to do it because yeah. I made it, you know, I put it out there and made it real. So it kind of held me accountable. Get it. Because otherwise yeah. it just lives in your head and it's, it'll, <clears throat> you know, it'll drive you crazy. That's an inspiration to me as well, to some extent, because like, you know, uh, I have this again, I have this project in my head and I'm, I'm doing projects on my own. You know, that's, that's why I kind of like started the YouTube channel for, to be able to play, yeah. you know, create something on my own. But, uh, but this project that I'm thinking of, like, it's a bigger beast, uh, and it involves more people than just me. And that's that's mm-hmm. that's always a little bit more scary than just doing you know yes something yeah. on your own. So yeah, uh, I I want to ask you about self distribution because I think you had probably good experiences, bad experiences with it. So having done that, like, what have you learned about self self distribution, and what do, do you wish you ha- you have done other you know differently? It's difficult. I'm not good at it. (laughs) So in the past, I had done with a buddy of mine, Ian McFarlane. He directed the Godfathers of Hardcore Agnostic Mm -hmm. Front documentary, if you guys are familiar with that. We did a documentary for a band called Slapshot. 
and we did a documentary called Rooters, the birth of Red Sox Nation. So Mm -hmm. those are two different experiences, but in both cases, we never saw a dime from either one of them because we went with distributors. They just, you know, same old story. They take it. Predatory. Yeah. yeah, You never really hear from them. And um, that was that, you know? So when I did this project, I decided, oh, and to back up, just to fill in the, the the blank there with Ian, like he did the, the Godfathers of Hardcore. Um, and I don't know if you guys heard about the whole distributor thing, distributor mess where I don't know no. how many filmmakers got. He, he, he had gone through them and it was doing really well and he was set up to to make out pretty pretty well with it. And then mm-hmm. the company claimed bankruptcy and oh, everyone got screwed and never saw a dime. And it wasn't just him. It was like a couple hundred filmmakers and millions oh, of dollars. Wow. No, I didn't hear um, that. So yeah, Google that. It's uh, Anyone who's interested in getting into trying to figure out how to make their own film and distribute it, I would recommend the Indie Film Hustle podcast. And he's yeah. got a whole, he talks yeah. about it a lot on there too. Um, yeah. So, because I had done a couple, I had done, put out a couple of just, dvds on my own with different hardcore bands where i just sold it i mean this was years ago before you could do digital downloads Mm -hmm. um it was dvd basically i had dvds pressed and just sold them myself through like a paypal website and that went okay i made my money back so i figured nowadays there's companies like the one i used was gumroad or Mm -hmm. vimeo you can sell directly so i figured i'm gonna try this first and see what i can do from it just try to build up a little instagram following or facebook or whatever i also figured the people that i profiled have their own little following so that might help also Mm -hmm. which it did you know i basically i mean i sold enough to cover my hard costs meaning travel and a little bit of equipment you know that that was really only my cost and then a lot of my own time but i covered that and then i made enough to basically fund season two that's pretty much it. <laughs> um, it's up on Tubi. I haven't really seen anything from it. I'm told that AVOD is the way to go, but it's kind of hard to run ads. Like, cause the way it's, I have it set up with my distributor, I don't know. Like if I run a Facebook ad, like I don't get any direct response. Like I don't know if people are watching it on Tubi mm-hmm. for like three months, three or four months. Yeah. So like yeah. once a quarter I find out and that hasn't, so I haven't been like pushing that, which, so in, unless you have a way to drive the traffic there, you're not going to make any money. So mm-hmm. that is kind of, I guess my fault, but I don't really know how to go about doing it. I think I would re- recommend if you're going to try something, go through film hub. Cause I think film hub gives you better numbers, like quicker. Yeah. It, uh, it's the same Alex old story with distribution. Good. Like, yeah. Yes. Alex Ferrari yeah. has this book, right? Film, uh, film entrepreneur. Uh, we actually made a video about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think yep. that's 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 probably like you know a formula to follow, but of course it's 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 easier you know to 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 talk about this stuff than actually implement it in. in yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's. As I always. mean, it's all it's all right on. It's like everything in his book is like. It reminded me of the way we used to run our run bands. It's like, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, it's all DIY. You make your own merch. Yeah. You, you go out and you, you it's except digitally. That's how we were already kind of operating. Like years ago, when me and Ian went with the actual distributors, we did that because we thought, well, this that's what you're supposed to do. And then yeah. after that, I did a couple on my own. Like for instance, I could if I sold a couple hundred DVDs directly myself, I'd make way more money than if thousands and thousands of people saw it through the distribution channels like, yeah. 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 yeah so it sort of depends on your i guess it depends on your goal i mean hell yeah. you could put yeah. it on youtube and and you're you might not see a dime from that but you'll get way more wow. eyeballs eyeballs on yeah exactly yeah yeah for me i just wanted to make enough money to to not lose money <laughs> you know be, yeah. it'd be great if i could if i could make enough money that I wouldn't, I could do like less weddings or something like that. So I could spend more time doing this and not have it cut into my income. But Uh, crowdfunding is like, you know, also an option, but, uh, but it has its, 
own disadvantages as well. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Again, it's like Alex's, job. Alex Ferrari's book is probably a good reference uh, for that as well. If anything, that book's inspiring and it yeah. kind of at least lays it out in the same way where like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. And then, but it's with most of those things, I mean, it says it, it's a hustle. So it's yeah. like a lot of work to do it and may the juice may not be worth the squeeze or it's like something that you just like have to keep working at. And, and that's like one of those things. I think it's even mentioned in um, Don't Stand in Line. Like if this is the mission, you got to be able to fully commit to it. And if you're not, then you're going to find yourself like out in the deep end. You're going to be like, you'll be fucked. <laughs> Basically, yeah. like well, kind of what am I doing? I just spent all this time. I'm not even into this. And it's like taking up so much of my time. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of exhausting to think about that. But if you're all in, then obviously it'll be a lot easier. But it's definitely even though it's simply laid out, it's not simple sometimes to my detriment it's like if you're not willing to do it just to the for the because you enjoy it whether or not you make any money on the back end or or, or you make you well whether or not you pull any money out of it right or not you have to be willing to do it just because you would you enjoy it yeah so sometimes that hurts me because i'll make it and then i just kind of forget to promote like i'll put i'll make something i've done this my whole life like i make it i feel like oh i made this thing and I'm just terrible at promoting stuff. I, 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 mm -hmm. I've tried, you know, I, but you know, my whole life, like the only time that anything's ever really like really taken off is because someone else wasn't involved in the promotion of it. And it's hard, it's hard to get someone in on something like that unless it's also theirs. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Right. I feel that pain in still withholding these moments. It was really good at the beginning. Yeah. But now that it's like, two, it'll be two years in October that we released Holding These Moments. But it's kind of the same thing that you had talked about, like the numbers with distribution, like you have seen the analytics and you're like, oh, how can I, how can I make it relevant again or make it so that more people will buy it and more people can see it and, and whatever. And it's like, you're shooting in the dark. You're like, well, I, you know, we had, I think EVR put up a bunch of YouTube stuff and cool, but it's like, it's just like me telling you that this is happening. And then you just got to trust that people are going to go see it because there's no like ticker that says, okay, ting, ting, ting. These are the amount of people that are seeing it. It's, you wouldn't find out until like months later. Yeah. And then kind of the same thing. It's like, oh, well I'm making this stuff, but self-promotion is, is, it's its own, so it's its own job. It's tough. <laughs> and when it's just you, it it's yeah, it's brutal. Yeah. It can be brutal. So the distributor I went with is, um, Indie Rights. I don't feel like they're trying to pull a fast one on me or anything else like that, but they don't really do anything to promote. And like, they don't say yeah. they're going to either. So it's, it's all on you. They'll put it in the channel and then you have to promote mm -hmm. it. But to be honest with you, you can do the same exact thing yourself through film hub. Yourself, yeah. And I'm thinking about just switching over, trying to pull it and, and get it on film hub, to be honest with you. Yeah. So that I can yeah. get yeah. that yeah. more direct feedback and figure out how to promote it. To me, I always figured, well, that's what the distributor does. It's like a record label or like they should be promoting, yeah. you know? But apparently that's not how that works anymore. <laughs> no. no, to my chagrin as well. It's just like, oh yeah, they're gonna help. Here's an email blast, <laughs> and yeah. that's it. And you're just like, oh, wait, what? And then I, by that time, I we figured it out. I was like, fuck, we gotta how we gonna make up for lost time and whatever. I feel like we've kind of gone off the beaten path, went down this. Yeah, sorry, I'll, hole, I'll, so let's bring I'll, it back to editing. <laughs> I'll talk about no, this. Fuck. I'll go way off course if you let me. So to go back to don't stand in line when you were. When you had that idea on paper, was it kind of, did, did you already have it in mind that it was going to turn out the way it did? Like it was going to be the episodic and you were going to have every character within the four people that you're talking about. And they're basically like each episode is like a theme that yeah. they're weighing in on and they're talking about. Or had you thought about it that it was going to be like a longer, it was going to be like a full length and you're like, oh wait, maybe I'll just change this up. Or how? what was your thinking in like developing that story? I'll be perfectly honest. Probably the first time ever that I've I've done something, it came out the way that I envisioned it. Envisioned it. Mm -hmm. It's like I don't know if you ever heard like I think Ira Glass talks about the gap where you're like you have this thing in your mind and like, but your skills don't mm -hmm. quite match up. This is the first time I felt like my skills matched up with what was in my head, and maybe that's bad. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to expand my head. You know what's in my head more, <laughs> but um, I yeah that was the way that I had planned it out. I've been watching, oh my God, way, just way too much Netflix, I think. Just 
I'm like docu series. Yeah. Like I like the idea of a docu series. It's it seemed more manageable to me. I think because I felt yeah. like a feature was overwhelming, but a a yeah. twenty minute episode I could handle like to create. And then it's just mm-hmm. you know, and once you make if you can get through one, well, you go to the next one, and it just seemed mm-hmm. less overwhelming to me for some reason. Whereas in the end, it's longer than any fe- like the other two features, yeah, way yeah, longer. Yeah. I think because I had the stories and the plan kind of hashed out in my head before I even started, it, it came together like much quicker and easier. Because you had said that you had learned from those other two features, basically plan ahead. Was there anything else in your experience working on the two features that helped you in editing or storytelling within Don't Stand in Line? No. <laughs> um <laughs> I can't think of anything off the top of my head. So you guys are on Premiere, right? You guys, like, if you want to get yep. technically, yep. I s- edited for years on Final Cut, old version of a Final Cut. When the new version came out, I actually, it took me a little bit, but I pretty much switched straight over to, to that. I was like, you know what? If I'm going to learn something new, I want to learn something entirely new. And if it's not cool, mm-hmm. I'll just go back and use the old version of Final Cut. So... Yeah. The way that Final Cut work helped me a lot in organizing the project with the keywording and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You can do a lot of that similar stuff in Premiere, but I think it's a little different. That helped me build out the project, if you want it like in technical terms. I think it would have been a lot harder for me to do it the old way that I used to work in like the old Final Cut. You yeah. asked me earlier about why I plan to do it as a docu-series. docu-series. One mm-hmm. reason is because I wanted to do multiple seasons. So, so okay. I figured, well, if I, I could easily do this, I had a list of like 30 people and I picked four. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, I can do this again. And like, I could do yeah. it with four more people if this goes well. So to go back to the editing process, now that I'm into the second season, in between mm-hmm. season one and season two, I started to get more into Resolve as an editor. Um, okay. Because for season one, I did all, I, I, I used Resolve for color correction. I had started... Mm-hmm trying to edit it season one and resolve and i got like a yeah. day into it and i was like this is too it was too buggy and flaky at that point yeah. but now it's like i use it better daily for editing um i'll use oh, yeah. final cut for smaller things here and there but like like mm-hmm. on my bigger projects like broadcast work and the documentary stuff i'm using resolve because the color correction is just yeah. phenomenal what you can do with it and i shoot most of my stuff on black magic cameras so I have the studio, I have like five versions of the, st- the studio version at this point I, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. I kept just buying cameras. Um, I shoot stuff on the stuff on B-Raw, which Final Cut won't play with. And I got mm-hmm. tired of transcoding. So yeah. I'm like, forget it. I'll just edit it all in Resolve. Again, I'm going, if I'm going way off, just let me know. But the other thing that if you guys are editing documentaries or talking head stuff, anything where you got to, mm-hmm. you basically come up with a radio edit, you should mm-hmm. you should look into a program called Descript. It's pretty amazing. So I took all my interviews for season two and loaded them into, um, you know, made, basically made proxies and put them on Descript. It transcribes it. Like you can search across all your interviews for like, say you just want, you, you type it in. You just say anytime where people are talking about skateboarding, for instance, and it, Every mm-hmm. instance where someone mentions skateboarding across all your interviews, it'll come up. So you can take all those yep. little bites and grab them. You can copy the text, put it in a different, it looks like you're just editing a word file, but it's also mm-hmm. building a timeline underneath. Yeah, you can edit video like you're editing a word file. And then you oh, can, wow. so it'll build it out. So you can you can search all your different topics and build out like a different, basically a document, what looks like a word document with all these different topics together but it'll give you a timeline and then that's great at the end of it you can export an xml and bring that into Mm -hmm. premiere resolve whatever final cut whatever you're working with it'll link back up to your original media and bam you've got your radio edit you know clean it up drop in your b-roll sweeten the audio and it's like when i figured out how to use it i was like this is ridiculous like i edited season two even though it's not fully shot like it's nine, you know, what, what, what's what been shot, I pretty much did a radio edit for all six episodes in like a couple of mm-hmm. days, like as oh, opposed wow. to a couple of weeks. 
Yeah. These days so. in Premiere, you can also like, you know, search uh, and you can transcribe and things like that. So that's doable in Premiere these days as well. Okay. Uh, but you don't have this feature where you just like, you know, select the word, delete it and things like that. Um, I have used mm -hmm. like so the, uh, the script, uh, but on, but a few versions ago. So I'm not familiar with the recent uh, version of the software. Uh, it's Personally, I'm not in love with the concept, to be honest. I mean, not for my purposes, at least. And I don't think I would have actually approached a documentary using this script because I think like in in, in my, at least in this, this is my opinion, like take, take it with- No, a it's, everyone's got their own process. But, so. Yeah, but I, I like to, you know, I like to watch the footage with those arms and ums and things like that because sometimes these moments are actually, you know, what actuates. actuates. Oh. Yeah, you know, gives the the hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll be honest. Like a lot of times, I put them back. I found like because yeah. because yeah. I was when I first did it, I was like, yeah, delete them all, and then I went back and I was like, no, 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 because you, <laughs> you need some breathing room and you want yeah. that. Yeah. When I first started editing documentaries, if I if you go back and look even at those two features, it's like basically Franken bite the thing together yeah. so perfectly that. Mm -hmm. It was almost it was too perfect. It didn't sound real. Mm -hmm. Um yeah. in in the like in Don't Stand in Line, it definitely has more of that breathing. Like there's more I feel like I left yeah. a lot more of that breathing, <clears throat> that imperfect stuff that you're talking about. So I hundred mm -hmm. percent agree with what you're saying about yeah. that. And I think, like you said, about Premiere, I know they have stuff like that. I wish Final Cut would have that. I wish result I wish they all had it built in. It, it makes a lot and I think they will soon yeah they will they will it's uh, to be honest like i, I, I feel like something like that if you look at you know their the releases and uh, new releases and things like that it's like they are all trying to imitate one another like final cut yeah. pro x is probably like you know the only one that is like out of the line um but the rest like just you know tries to get to the same point you know, they try to implement yeah, the same I mean, features and like one introduces a new feature, then a year later, the other adds, the, adds the, the, their own, you know, their own version of that feature and things like that. It's, I just feel like learn them all because when you get, like I had, I do have a client that wants stuff done in Premiere, but, but they don't need it done that often. So I don't even have the, my cloud subscription anymore because I was paying just, I wasn't using it that yeah. much. But you know, if you're using all the uh, all the other Adobe stuff heavily, yeah, Premiere's definitely the way to go. Like, because you have that dynamic link. No, that's a, that's a very good point. Like, you know, if if you're not like very deep in their ecosystem, then it's much easier to switch to something else and justifiable as well. Because like, uh, yeah, like Premiere is the, the the most expensive one on the market. <laughs> it is like maybe it kind of is. is I mean, because Avid is like, yeah. I think that that Avid is probably just slightly more expensive actually, but it's it's on the same level. Uh, yeah. But you know, do both you, Final you... Cut uh, is Final Cut. Cut is like you know one time payment, three hundred dollars, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you were doing it just by the math, forget about whether or not you like it or not. I paid three hundred dollars yeah. when that came out. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, I, okay. but I've also had a Creative Cloud account this entire time. Like, yeah, I, I can't even do the math. I mean, it's it was like six hundred dollars a year over ten yeah, years. Exactly. I think six thousand yeah. dollars to keep yeah, Premiere yeah. working, and I opened it six times in a year, yeah. maybe. <laughs> so a thousand dollars for each time you right you opened it. I mean, I would use Photoshop oh. and Illustrator <laughs> and stuff like that. But again, yeah, I, now I don't need those because there's other programs that I can do what I need to do. Yeah. And yeah. so I think they're going to need to rethink their pricing structure um, unless mm -hmm. all the other companies kind of switch, which I hope they don't. It's all about like distribution of the market and their audience, I think. I don't think we'll see a shift in like their approach. I'll, I'll think we'll see a shift in what kind of user they are after and what kind of users user generally like companies are after, right? So Avid right. is pro probably the best example here actually because Avid is actually very specific about the user they're yes. after, right? Yeah. They are only after professionals. Like they're, they're not even trying to get, uh, yeah. you know, beginners and cre like youth creators to use, to use Avid. Uh, and I think we'll see like more polarization in that aspect where it's like, you know, yeah. one company well, will go after that niche, the other one after that one, and so on. I, I want to ask you about work-life 
balance how do you how how do you deal, deal with it i i think you you have uh, family and kids right i think that's yeah. why you write on the blog post so how do you balance you know creating or doing your own project and working for clients and also like you know uh having family life it's a struggle i mean i work from home like yeah. m most other people these days It's diff it's definitely a little different now than it was a couple years ago because my wife's now also working from home full time. Luckily we can do that. The kids are old enough they can get on the bus and get off the bus and uh -huh. we don't have to uh -huh. drive them to school. But I struggle with it all the time. Like I have a client right now that it's actually a broadcast client that wants me to travel more and do more and it's not uh -huh. that It's not that I can't do it, but if I do that, that's either going to take away from family time or it's going to take away from the the projects that to me are more important, my own projects. But I'm balancing all these different things. I'm doing post-production for a publishing company. I'm doing weddings. I'm doing broadcast work and I'm doing documentary work. And I'm I'm in the process of trying to hopefully get a feature documentary funded that I can't really talk too much about. But if that goes through, it's like, okay, well, something's going to have to give. It's probably that broadcast client <laughs> because, yeah. which is tough because I say, I say that. And like, I was, I came to that decision on the same day. We actually just got nominated for a couple of local Emmys, which is like, mm -hmm. like, isn't that what you want? You know, isn't that what you, yeah. you, you dream about? Like to me, it's like not nearly as satisfying as, doing my own projects though because i'm still it's like yeah that's it's great but like it's not nearly as fulfilling as the emails i get from people who were inspired by watching don't stand in line which yeah the work-life balance you know it changes i think over time when my kids were younger that that's when i stopped doing my own personal stuff mm -hmm. like i got married mm -hmm. i had kids my daughter who was my firstborn is about to turn 13. i didn't do a personal mm -hmm. project for a good 10 years just because I wanted to, I had to figure out how I was going to pay the bills and spend time with yeah. them. Now that they're a little older, I'm able to start doing that stuff. So, I mean, everyone's got to juggle it and figure it out. I don't know what where you guys are at with it. Um, I would, I'm always curious to hear what other people have to say about it. I, I don't have kids, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> well, that makes it easier. <laughs> so, but I have a wife, so, and she likes family time. So I always take a break because I, being freelance for so long and always working like 16 hours, you know, when I was single, it'd be like, okay, I'm going to sit down in the morning and then I'm going to get up and go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> so, and now it's, you know, even though I either. still have that, <laughs> yeah, it's not healthy either. But also now that I have, because I can easily get into that mode, but now I'm like trying to wean myself out of that. And especially because I, I'm overseas and most of my clients are eight hours behind me. Wow. So, Yeah. In a way, I'm still doing that, but I'm also like, okay, guys, it's 5 p.m. here. I'm going to go and ha eat dinner and hang out with my wife, and then maybe I'll be back later if you need me. So yeah. that's how I've kind of been doing it. And yeah. luckily, all of my clients in Denver and whatever are really adamant about like, it's 11 o'clock there. You should be in bed. Stop fucking working. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah. So that helps a lot, too, that people are, are that cool and they appreciate me and don't just think of me as like someone who's working for them right um working hard yeah but, <laughs> well that's a good yeah it was a good point yeah. about clients like that are good and sometimes mm -hmm. i've had clients in the past that if you behave like you're on call they'll treat you like you're on call like 24 7 yeah. so you have to set those boundaries i had a yeah. client that wanted me i mean it was like over the weekend it was like all like which isn't really unusual, I guess, for what we do. But for me, it was like, no, I don't, I'm not working over the weekend. I'm not working past five. Doesn't mean I don't ever work, mm -hmm. but it just means I'm not there yeah. for your call and your, unless it's an emergency, you know what I mean? Like yeah. I try to set those boundaries and it, it, again, it doesn't mean I'm not, I don't ever work on the weekend or I don't ever work past five because I definitely yeah. do. But it's, it's, um, trying to catch up with the things that I wasn't able to do because I was dealing with clients, you know, yeah. or trying yeah. to work on my personal projects. So having boundaries is like is a big one. I think, yeah, I try to I try to do it as well whenever I can. Uh, for me, boundaries like you know they blend uh, for my personal projects. So for the, yeah. the, definitely, mm -hmm. but for clients, yeah, I I, I I like to have boundaries and you know uh, set expectations early on it's t 
because when you set, set ex expectations, it's very rarely a problem for a client. They just right. need to have mm -hmm. those expectations, right? If they don't, then you may find yourself in a situation where, where, where they want you to do something when you don't want to do it, basically, because of, right. yeah, because of work, work life balance and respect for yourself. And you have to respect yourself. Yeah. If you don't want to be a burnout one day, you have to respect your time. Right. I mean, the other part of it, I would say, if you can, it kind of goes with it is under promise and over deliver. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of hard for them to give you a, a hard, like, you know, give you shit over setting certain boundaries if you're always delivering ahead of schedule for them. They'll just kind of mm -hmm. start to understand that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. And you'll have it done. You're you're not going to be late. You're going to get it done. Like, and that's really what they want. I mean, a lot of yeah. times they'll mm -hmm. they'll be freaking out about something over the weekend that's not mm -hmm. due for another month, yeah. because they might be used to people who aren't, you know, don't deliver on time. Yeah, very yeah. good point. Yeah, I have had like a similar experience. I think so. Yeah, we're on the same page here. <laughs> yeah, uh, Anthony, do, do, do you have do you have like a fav speaking about like you know pages? Like, do you have a favorite book uh, about filmmaking, about editing, something like that? Uh, about editing, I haven't really read many books on editing. Um, mm -hmm. That's fair. I do. You don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should. Um, but as far as like you know, I the the film film entrepreneur is what it's called. Yeah, great yeah. one. Rise of the film entrepreneur. Um, yeah, Gary V has a lot of good stuff mm -hmm. on you know yeah. just marketing yourself and and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's not really a filmmaking book, but in general, if you want a recommendation, then then I think like Jacob Brika's book, uh, Documentary Editing Principles and Practice, is a good one. Uh, okay, I mean you know doing a project like you do. Uh, I found it very inspiring. Like, you know, I felt like I, when I read it, I was like, God damn it. I want a doc to work on. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I just like watch, like, I, I definitely should read some more books on, on editing since it's what I do, but I, I watch a lot of things. And honestly, I just, I just copy the cool shit that I see. <laughs> or I, tr I try to anyways. <laughs> um, Get it. Yeah. I'm like, well, how did they do that? I mean, that's how I figured out. That's how I figured out all of it, to be honest with you. I mean, if I go back and look at some of the stuff, the early things that I edited, the first thing I ever truly edited and put out into the world was the documentary on my band. Well, it was more of a live show. Mm -hmm. And um, I had like three different people in the crowd with mismatched cameras, like nothing looked right. It was mm -hmm. all just people who had like, um, mini DV cameras, put them on auto and pointed them at us. So all the colors were wrong. I didn't know how to color correct. So everything's in black and white. And there's there's not even, even it's all just like dissolves. The whole, sh it's like dissolve, 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 dissolve. And I don't know why I did that. I think it was because of some of the videos I was like, the bike, the BMX videos I was watching at the time, that's how they did things. And I was like, I, that's how you do it. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I watch it now and I cringe so, I mean, you know, I don't know. I think a lot of it is just a lot of learning is just like trial and error and Im imitation. The insight from from why people do things, though, you can't necessarily get. That's what I think you you would get from a book like that, probably. Is that correct? Like the motivation behind doing things a certain way? Yeah, kind of, kind of. Although, although like uh, Jacob Bricka's book is very academic because he's okay. he's a professor. It's written really well. It's an academic book, but in a good sense, I would say, uh, okay. where you really get like a really thorough investigation of editing pro process for documentaries with examples, okay. um, you know, um, with case studies, things like that. Very good stuff, really. The biggest one that we've talked about a lot is the Walter Murch book okay. uh, in the blink of an eye. Yeah. It's like a series of seri series of essays about editing, uh, and some of them are just very insightful and very interesting. Like approached for a from a very unique angle, uh, I think because like Walter Murch, he's uh, he's just he finds interest in so many areas that he finds connections that are kind of like invisible for most people, I think, between genres and between like, you know, areas of knowledge and things like that. 
So yeah, yeah. Uh, I I, hmm. I I don't know. I love this guy. I I I hope we get to interview him one day. That would be a highlight of my life. <laughs> yeah, I I wish you know that's one thing that I haven't done much is narrative stuff. I've done some commercials that were kind of narrative, but that's that's mm -hmm. about it. I really I would love to be able to do that. That's like the next thing I want to try and do, but it's a whole yeah. different ball game trying to get into that. Just recently, have I started playing with that? It's interesting because it's like, you know, when you're so used to cutting documentaries and kind of like building the story from a bunch of a pile of pieces right. and then cutting narrative, it's, it's a totally different animal. Actually, directions. <laughs> so, uh, Anthony, what's next for you then? We're still uh, working on Don't Stand in Line season two. I need four subjects. I filmed three of them last year. I'm um, hoping to film the fourth this year and, and just trying to keep going with that. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to just keep doing that as long as people are interested in it. Cause nice. I'm hope, I mean, the other reason that I want to do it is I feel like it's not a one-off product. You know what I mean? So like you, you put, mm -hmm. you know, three years into a feature length documentary, you put it out there, you promote it and you do all this work and then it, it goes and it does its thing. And then you have to start yeah. over for the, your next project. So I'm hoping this is like, yeah. th that was the other reason I wanted to do like more of a, a series because hopefully I'm not starting from scratch every time I do a new season, you know? Oh, right. So it can hopefully yeah. build on itself. And someone, you know, if I get to, I don't know, in five seasons of it, someone might be interested in a person that's in season five if, have, and would never have checked out any of the other ones, but now they've, they watch mm -hmm. season five and they're like, well, let's go check out what's in season one and they might get, you know, cause that, that happens yeah, to right. me when I watch right. stuff on, on Netflix or whatever, Hulu, that's sort of the idea. So keep going with that. Okay. And cool. So where can people follow your work and, or follow you online or anything like that? Codecprojects.com. So anyone who's familiar with editing, hopefully knows what that word is. C O D E C projects.com. Mm -hmm. Codec projects on Instagram. I don't know. There's a Facebook, I think, too, but I don't really do much with it. Well, thanks so much, Anthony, for talking with us. Oh, today. thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having me. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. 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 Should... I, I love the stuff you said about self distribution because, like, I think like that's that's really a challenge for a lot of people, and it's good to hear about from you know about the experiences of people who have done it. So, thank you for that. Yeah. No, oh, definitely. <laughs> Uh, sometimes Ricky, I wonder like what drives us because you can see that Anthony is someone who is driven is he's driven by purpose like mm -hmm. you know the career that we took on uh, mm -hmm. the editing career and filmmaking career yeah. is not an easy one and like <laughs> I'm not the first one to say it I'm not, not the first one to agree to it uh, it's not an easy one but no. you can see that he is driven by by something deeper, something inside him. And that's mm -hmm. what I loved. That's what I loved about the interview, uh, about like meeting him, uh, yeah. getting to know him. Anthony is like an everyman. He's like on our level. He's doing things himself and he's yeah. making it happen. You know, he's not a Hollywood editor like we have on other interviews we have. So, you know, that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk with him because he is successful in his own right. Um, and so getting that perspective, I think is very important, especially for something who is working. He's not standing in line. He's outside yeah, he's of the system. Setting in line. <laughs> he's making it. He's making it happen. I thought that was, and I think that's very important to hear about. You know, whatever the level of, of success is, like mm -hmm. we all, we each one of us defines his own success, right? So right. I think like having this asset of don't stand in line that mm -hmm. he owns, he created yeah. himself. Yeah. Uh, this is a huge success, like in my opinion. We hope that you enjoyed our talk with Anthony. Um, have a great day, everybody. And as always, shoot and edit. Like there is no tomorrow. And the <laughs> last thing, as I always say, like send us a message. Like let us know how you like it or ask, 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 ask a question for the future episodes. Uh, you can record the message with the SpeakPipe link uh, at the bottom of the episode uh, in the description. Uh, yeah. So do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day. If you like what you've heard, please rate, review, and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you've listened to this on. 
Your reviews help more people discover this show. You can also follow us on Instagram. Just search for at cut to reveal and tell your friends. And if you have any questions or comments, send them to podcast at cut to the point.com. And who knows, maybe we'll use them in the future episodes. And as we say around here, until the next time, shoot and edit like there is no tomorrow. Thank you.